I'm DC. And I'm Michael. And you're listening to the Monster Guys Podcast. Today we'll be talking about someone who was considered to be a master in the kitchen, had the reputation of a psychic within her community, and had a penchant for poison. Her name is Ottilie, or otherwise better known as Tilly Klemek, the Poison Widow. Welcome to the Monster Guys Podcast as we continue our series, Monsters Among Us. And we've had a good series so far, Michael. We've talked about Elizabeth Bathory, H.H. Holmes. We had a very special Friday the 13th episode just this past week. And we do appreciate everyone giving us feedback. We've had a lot of great feedback on this series so far. So we're really glad that you all are enjoying it, and uh, we hope it just gets better over these next couple of episodes. Michael, let's start with the poison, with this poison widow. Some people call her the Black Widow or a Black Widow. Historically, that's been a name that's given to a lot of women killers, but I think she's better known as a poison widow, a poison killer. Tilly Klemek, she used arsenic a lot, and particularly from the pest control product called Rough on Rats. And it was, uh, it was a popular, or actually a new and gaining in popularity product that was introduced in the 1870s. It was touted as a way to rid homes of rats, mice, roaches, flies, beetles, ants, mosquitoes, bedbugs, insects, skunk, weasel, gophers, chipmunks, moles, and muskrats. So kind of, uh, an all-around get-it-done type of product, but I'm sure they had no idea that it was also going to be used to rid homes of husbands or children. I'm not sure (laughs) it was good for their popularity. Uh, Probably not. I have to stop and wonder, just on the name itself, why they called it Rough on Rats when it seemed to cover so much more. I didn't realize that it covered just that much. Yeah, and, you know, I'm sitting here looking at a an old picture of the front of the box, 15 cents per box. It clears out rats, mice, bed bugs, flies, and roaches. So probably because those were common pests that people were dealing with uh, on a day-to-day basis. But of course, they wanted to they wanted to get them all. So the list goes on. I got them all and yep. got more. In and in Tilly's case, also snuffed out several of her husbands, and a whole laundry list of other people. So let's talk about Tilly Klemek, the poison widow. Where can we go from the point of arsenic? Well, usually in our other episodes so far, we would cover the childhood, but not much is really known of Tilly, of her childhood. She was born in 1876. It was funny that you said that Rough and Rat started in the 1870s. It seems like there's a a parallel there. Synchronicity. Um, But she was brought over from Germany with her parents, who were Polish immigrants, when she was just an infant. So, And from there, we just know that she grew up in what was considered to be Little Poland in Chicago. Uh, There really isn't much that's spectacular about her life up until the death of her first husband. Well, and and the thing is, is that she was married at 14 to John Mikowitz. And really for, I guess, nearly 30 years of marriage, it was largely uneventful. So not just an uneventful childhood other than, you know, coming to America and, and beginning life anew here with her family, but growing up and being married at a young age, that was common then among, you know, many cultures. And I'm sure that would have had its own effects, but for 30 years of marriage, you don't really hear of much. And then all of a sudden, 
they start dropping like flies. <laughs> <laughs> well, it should be noted that some people actually list that as a possible motive of hers. To this day, nobody knows entirely why she did what she did. Kind of like H.H. H. Holmes, she did collect on the life insurance of her husband's, and we'll go over that more as we but talk. But that seems to be a very popular thing during this era. Because what we find is among killers, men and women, the more we uncover these killers, the more we learn that they're collecting on life insurance. A very popular scheme, scheme that was going on in that time and pretty easy to get away with for a while. Didn't take them long to catch on, though. No. So that was definitely something that she did and did consistently, but that's not... That wasn't her M.O. with everybody. Um, and she seemed to kill other people just out of grudges or purely small irritation. So her motives are still kind of unknown. Now, I mentioned in, in the intro that she was a master in the kitchen and considered to be a psychic by many in the community. She was known to be a good cook, which is where she cooked up a lot of her <laughs> poison treats. She would wrap the arsenic in candy and give them away as treats, and, and that's how she would poison some people, allegedly. But she was also known to be a psychic, to, to, to be psychic within the community, which is a very interesting piece of her story, because this reaches beyond humans even to where she was predicting things about stray dogs. Many believe that her predictions were really just self-fulfilling prophecies. So let's talk about that a little bit. How did she get this reputation of being a psychic within the community well, and even among dogs? You bring up two points that I actually want to talk about real quick. Um, back to her motives. That's what I'm here for, Michael. <laughs> back to her motives. One of the, the possible motives was that just that she was tired. You know, she had had a lot of kids, I guess, throughout her life. From what I understand, at least, it's kind of hard to track down some of the lineage here, but she had reared some children. She was a housewife that took care of the house, and she was known through the community for being a good cook. So some people just suggest that after years of doing all of that, she just got tired and kind of snapped one day. Just kind of snapped. She had a hard life. It was not an easy life. Definitely not. Coming over from another country into a country that is in turmoil as it is. Into and Chicago too. Into Chicago, having a lot of children, you know, having the expectations that were placed on women at the time and living that life for decades, she just snapped. And this is in the community. It's Remember, she came over to the U.S. as an infant, but even throughout her, you know, the rest of her life, she was said to have only spoken and broken English. So there's a separate community going on that she is a part of that's kind of isolated from the rest of the outside world. Going back to your point on being psychic, this is still somewhat debated by people. She was known for predicting the deaths of certain people. Claims of her being psychic seem to be anecdotal. And I kind of want to stop there and say that a lot of what we know about her is question not questionable, but uh, specific details seem to get muddled. Not necessarily to the point where, you know, people didn't die. Yeah, we know she definitely did murder people with arsenic, but if you'll notice in different newspaper excerpts at the time, uh, names and dates got kind of mixed up. When she died later on in life, they listed her as being several years older than she actually was. So it's all kind of just a little bit muddled. So whether or not she actually claimed to be a psychic is still kind of unknown, but she was a little bit flamboyant in some of the deaths. She was actually known as flaunting knowledge that people were about to die. Well, I, I think the concept of her, the idea of her being psychic was more in line with the legend of the person versus the person. And I believe some of those stories and rumors swirled and probably because of her personality, she played off of that maybe. But again, I, I think the whole thing with the psychic ability was just more legend and she used that. She leveraged it to her advantage. I'm mean, to the point where she was predicting the deaths of dogs in the neighborhood. <laughs> in my opinion, could have been practice runs for human 
runs. Yeah. I think it was her second husband, possibly, that she said she did have a dream that he was sick in bed. And then lo and behold, not too long after that, he was actually sick in bed and died. So let's track the deaths of these husbands quick, because that's actually an important turning point in her life. And she didn't have any shortage of them, that's for sure. She really didn't. Uh, she did not take her time re remarrying at all either. So her 30 first... years, the first one, and then the rest of them were all like gone in months, I think. <laughs> Uh, and you said John Mikowitz, was it? John Mikowitz. And sometimes, just for the sake of listeners, sometimes these names, like John Mikowitz, is listed as Joseph Mikowitz in some places. So there's there's a bit of muddling of the names even. You've got a mix up of Joseph and John's in a couple of places and some of the children and the cousins that we'll be speaking of are listed with different names along the way and not really sure why that is. It could be bad reporting, but it also could be a bastardization of Polish names that kind of gets mixed up here and there because yeah. some of the last names keep the general sound, but they're spelled differently. In different places, yeah. So it's kind of uh, kind of murky. So her first husband, John Mikowitz, this is the one that she was married to for nearly 30 years. Yes. And while other husbands were later said to be alcoholics or possibly abusive, and this was not ever really brought up in the trial, and I, I don't really think it's the case because she didn't play on it, but while those were brought up after the fact with some of her husbands, this was not the case with him. It really just seems like she kind of snapped one day. He died. The cause of death was said to be heart failure or um, heart trouble. But Tilly quickly took the life insurance money, which totaled to be around $1,000. And within just the space of a couple of months, she remarried to Joseph Ruskowski. Yeah, John Mitkowitz died 1914. She was already married again in 1914 to John Ruskowski, which is also sometimes listed as Joseph. Maybe we should just go by last names. This is Mitkowitz <laughs> well, the, and Ruskowski. The last names are going to get just as confusing too here in yeah, a Yeah, so the second husband, John or Joseph Ruskowski, uh, she married in 1914, and he also died that same year. Yeah, actually three months after they got married. Yeah, very very fast turnaround. And he had about $2,000 that she got off of him. I think it was $1,200 in life insurance, and the rest was in cash. Mm -hmm. Again, she didn't take very long after that. Uh, apparently, she was actually having an affair at the time with a man named, again, Joseph. This one, not Ruskowski, but either Grantkowski or Guskowski. Yeah, I, I see it normally listed as Joseph Grantkowski, but he's a boyfriend also died in 1914 Yeah, because so, he pissed her off. It's interesting to figure out. I, I had, can't find the source of this story, but basically she went on a trip to Milwaukee with him, vacation of sorts after the death of her husband. And she really wanted him to marry her. She was kind of pressing for him to propose. During that time, though, she kind of let it slip that she had caused the death of her husband's before by poison. So he kind of freaked out at her, obviously, and threatened to go to the police about it. And of course, she poisoned him after that because of his threat. There was no life insurance collected because they were not married. But she got somebody that could have potentially been a threat to her removed from, from the picture. Yeah. And later on... So that's three down in yeah. 1914. I don't know when uh, that guy's sister died, but later on, she would also be accused of killing his sister after his sister came to Tilly and got into a fight. This was one of the people that died by the poison candy. So uh, moving on from that, though, five years later, she married Frank Kupschkik. So you have a, a bit of a gap there between um, what seemed like a rapid fire succession of deaths. Which makes me wonder, what was she doing for five years? Maybe she was trying to lay low. 30 years goes by she goes on a spree in 1914 and then it's quiet for five years well this may be actually that that five-year period may be where the the mystery man is there's a mystery man in this case called myers oh yes that's right we don't know anything about Myers except for that single name. He, he was, was a possible husband, but many consider him just a, a boyfriend or a sweetheart. That apparently she lived with, but we don't really know anything else about him. So he's kind of a weird person in this case. 
and he was considered missing after the trial because they could never prove that he was killed off by her. But that might be the five-year gap. We don't know. But after after that gap, she married Frank, and he died in 1921. So after three years of marriage to him, <laughs> uh, Frank passes away. Frank is actually an interesting part of her history here. He only gave her $675 in life insurance, so she didn't really get a lot off of him. But this is where she starts to become a little bit of a braggart. She does things like uh, tell him, you know, you don't have much to live at his bedside as he's lying ill and dying she's knitting a, a hat which would become famous later on for his funeral and she actually starts to go pick out funeral linens and she actually goes and finds an ad for a 30 dollars coffin at the time and tells the landlady you know i'm going to store this coffin in the basement yeah i think the the clerk at the fabric store where she bought fabric for her dress and her hat even was paying respect and she said well not till 10 days from now the clerk asked, you know, when did your husband die? And <laughs> instead of answering past tense, that's what Tilly was saying was like, well, you know. Ten days from now. Which is slightly humorous, but in a very dark and twisted way, I guess. But it also shows that she was kind of starting to get a little bit cocky. Yeah, but there are people who knew her and, I don't know, interviewed her or, or worked with her who said that she was a very smart woman, yeah. very intelligent. There was a... You couldn't tell it on the surface, but if you knew her and you talked to her, there was a deep intelligence about her. Yeah, it was actually Genevieve Forbes after or, or during the trial, I should say, that she went ham in this investigation. She was actually known for being a crime journalist, which was pretty amazing at the time because there were not many, if, if any women, there were not many that were crime journalists. It was kind of considered to be dangerous and not something that you want to be into. So she actually tracked down Tilly's parents who were quite distraught at uh, the nature of the case and everything during the time, but she tracked them down. She talked to family members aside from them. She talked to neighbors. She talked to Tilly herself as well. And Genevieve Forbes was talking about how Tilly was a very ugly woman, saying that she and her family had the um, just this ugly knot of hair on the back of her head. She had this greasy complexion, ruddy skin. She was kind of frumpy and not, you know, she, she had a lot of bad things to say. But she turned around and said that the woman's intellect was undeniable that she was extremely smart and that in a strange statement she said the emotions were the yardsticks of her intellect so she believed and saw the dark genius of sorts that brewed beneath the surface but during that time with frank it's also something to be noted that after he did die uh, a famous part of the case was that she blared jazz music and danced to it in the living room on the victrola which was kind of like a uh the gramophone. Oh, yeah, like a LP player with the big yeah. shell coming out of the top of it. Yeah, so it, it was kind of a... Creepy records are played on these days. <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> and in this case, it's kind of creepy. I mean, she's... So this guy's dead in his bedroom, and she's celebrating it. Yeah, and I believe this is 1921 at this point, and by this time, Tilly is considered to be quite the notorious person. And there's even a saying that was circulated about her that to marry Tilly was a certain death sentence. And it's interesting to note that while people reported about her being ugly, and one reporter even called her homely, but people would write this about her, how ugly she was or frumpy or homely or unattractive, but this woman kept finding people to marry her. Well, marry Marry and have affairs with. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe she was ugly uh, according to those standards of the day, but there was somebody that found something. There were a lot of people that found something attractive about her. It was and her maybe cooking. It, may, huh? it was her cooking. Her cooking. <laughs> maybe it was her intellect, though. There's a beauty about people that you know, is certainly far deeper than, than skin. Well, given the way that she talked to the landlady and the fabric lady at the time of getting ready for the funeral, she's definitely seemed to have a sense of humor about her. She was very snappy. I think she had a, a certain charisma about her. And there's something very attractive about that in a person. So she may have been that type of person, just like H.H. H. Holmes that we talked about last week, even though he was considered to be a handsome person, according to standards of the day, his 
his charisma, his personality, his ability to get right up close and personal with somebody upon first meeting them was an attractive point. And maybe this was the case with Tilly. It's something that you see in a lot of serial killers, actually. It talks about how charismatic or how charming they are. Very true. So that could have been a high part of the case. And it's actually notable at this point as well, because at Frank's funeral, Joseph Klemek comes into the picture. Joseph Klemek is about in his 50s at this point. He's pretty healthy for his age, and he's not a bad looker from what I can see in the old newspaper photos. But he was unmarried. He wanted a wife and I guess took a liking to Tilly right away. She left from the funeral and he would later defend her saying that she just wasn't feeling up to being around people. She was feeling too bad because of Frank's death. But within a matter of weeks, I guess, he was marrying her. And he said later on that he married her for the home, specifically the cooking, the fact that he liked her crocheting skills. These were all attractive traits to him. So, And this is husband number four officially. Yeah. At this point, Joseph Klemek, he is one that she poisoned but recovered. He did not die, which is going to play, interestingly enough, and very heavily into the rest of her story. But let's stop for a second because the Chicago Tribune in March 14th, 1923 edition actually lists Tilly's alleged victims. And I find this to be an interesting list. This does not include the three dogs (laughs) and some of the neighbors and associations within the community that she had that she also was accused of killing. But you've got first husband, second husband, and third husband and boyfriend gone. All right, that's right off the top. The funny thing is, is that prior to that, she was already busy because there's three cousins that she allegedly murdered by arsenic. And then, of course, you had the sweetheart that we don't know if he was a husband or a boyfriend, Myers, that you mentioned earlier, that was killed. Then you have the first husband of Nellie Kulik. Now, Nellie was a cousin of Tilly, and we're going to talk more about her in a minute, but her husband was killed arsenic found. Then you've got the granddaughter of Nellie who was killed. You've got the daughter of Nellie that was killed. There seems to be like a a running theme here. The twin brother of Sophie, who was the daughter of Nellie, was killed. (laughs) (laughs) Then, of course, Joseph Klemek was poisoned, but he recovered. We'll talk about him more in just a moment. Then you've got the son of Nellie that was poisoned. Then he recovered and died later, and he thought his mother Nellie actually poisoned him, but Tilly was accused of it. Then you've got a neighbor or a friend, uh, Mrs. Rose Split, who was poisoned by one of Tilly's candies. And I think that was because Joseph Klemek actually talked to her and Tilly got jealous. Yeah. Was the, the newspaper Right. And so then there's also a sister of a former boyfriend of Tilly who uh, was poisoned. Then you've got another cousin that was poisoned, but he recovered. Then you've got a sister-in-law of Frank Kupsik, the third husband, who was poisoned after eating at Tilly's, but she recovered. Then you've got a daughter, another daughter of Nellie, uh, Tilly's cousin, who was poisoned, died, and was said to have suffered from heart trouble. So that's like 20 on the list there, (laughs) plus three dogs, plus I think there's at least another seven to ten neighbors and close associates that were on a list as well at some point that fingers were pointing to Tilly. So we're not just talking about lovers. We're talking about a whole range of family, extended family, friends, relatives, and the neighborhood dogs. Yeah, and they all bear, um, except for the husbands, who seem to be either irritation and or life insurance. The rest of them seem to be irritation. Like the three cousins, I guess Tilly had been in an argument with their mother, so she offs all of them. Yeah. You know, you have Rose, the person that Joseph Clement talked to, and Tilly, uh, by all accounts, got jealous, so she tried to poison her. Two of the dogs were Joseph Clement's. She didn't like them, so before she tried to poison him, she poisoned them. And then one of the other dogs was a neighbor's dog who was barking, and she didn't like it, so she poisoned that dog. You have this list of grievances that she just seems to pick willy-nilly to go off on. Yeah, so moral of the story, don't get on this woman's blacklist. (laughs) 
Because she will feed you rough on rats, arsenic and soot. By the way, rough on rats, the whole mixture of that was arsenic and soot. That was it? That was it. I, if, <laughs> if I remember, I read the ingredients. It was arsenic and soot. So you almost had straight poison. So if you got on this woman's blacklist, I mean, pretty guaranteed you're going to be fed arsenic candy at some point. Yeah. And I just, I don't know. I don't know why people, it's like H.H. H. Holmes. It's It makes you wonder why people didn't catch on faster. Well, I wonder if they did and they were just in fear. That's a possibility, I guess. But, you know, she fed all of these people. It's not like she went and injected them with a syringe or anything. These people had to accept these candies and stews and pies and, that she was making. Yeah, her meals and everything. So it just, I don't know, it makes me wonder, you know, what exactly was going on here. So she poisons Joseph Klemek because uh, she is not happy in this newest marriage. And she actually tells Nellie this. And as the story goes, Nellie suggests that they get a divorce. And Tilly's words are exactly, no, I'll, I'll figure out a different way to get rid of him. I, I question this part of the story because it talks about how Nellie actually goes and gets rough on rats and hands it to Tilly. Maybe she supplied her with this. This is actually in the in the court trial. They said that Nellie was the one who supplied the arsenic. And maybe this is the case, but it makes me wonder where did she get the arsenic for everything else? Did she, was she just out of rough on rats at her house that day? <laughs> and she just went over to Nellie's to grab some? I don't know. Hey, Nellie, I'm out of arsenic. Can you spare a little <laughs> for the spaghetti? <laughs> I mean, because apparently Nellie was busy too, so. Did they eat spaghetti back then? I don't know. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure they did. <laughs> So she is supplied this rough We had spaghetti rats. for dinner, so it's top of mind. It's National Pasta Day as of this recording from what I understand. Oh, I so we had that. spaghetti and meatballs, and I was digging through it for arsenic just to <laughs> see if it was mixed in with the Parmesan. It'd be scary, especially after this. But yeah, so she, she poisons Joseph Klemek. And Joseph, up until this point, it's interesting. Th this is where that charisma comes back into play. Uh, he was so smitten with her for some reason or another that she tried to warm off saying, look at the last three husbands, you know, you don't want to end up like them. And he was like, no, I'm much stronger than they are. I'm much healthier than they are. I'm hardy. I'll be fine. Well, his own family tried to sway him away from her. Yes. And and dissuade him from marrying this woman, but he just wouldn't have it. So when he took ill, it was actually his family, his brother, John Klemek, that came in and insisted that a, a personal doctor come in to check out Joseph. He had apparently grown suspicious, especially given the fact that Joseph's two dogs just up and died recently. So this doctor comes in and notices... Dad gummy, you kill my dog, I'm coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the doctor notices that... Joseph's arms and legs are stiff and that his breath smells like garlic. And these are apparently common. This is how bad it was at the time. This was a common symptom of arsenic poisoning and the yeah. doctor recognized it. <laughs> well, and here, let's let's make this point at this juncture because you were talking to me about this earlier. Arsenic was a common, commonly used poison for murder. In this time, who knows why, maybe the, the recent introduction, maybe it was hard to detect, but it was used so much that they were able to find detections. And this is a point in time when murder by women increased over 400%. Which is ridiculous. Uh, but this is where we get stories like the play, Chicago. Um, the two women that that play is based off of come from just a couple of years after Tilly's story. Yeah, this is a year after her trial to the two other Chicago killers, Beulah Anan and Belva Gartner. Inspiration for the musical... Chicago were in the headlines. Yeah. So this was a very big going on at this time. Women murdering was on the uprise. I guess in this particular county, um, there were actually 28 other women who were convicted of murder and got away with it. Got away with it, yeah. And only a few at that time were ever actually persecuted for it, Tilly being one of them. I think there were a total of five in that particular era. Going back to Joseph, John and the doctor kind of recognize that arsenic is 
at play here. So they whisk him away to the hospital and he does recover, but he's bedridden for, I think, most of the trial from what I understand, which happens a year later. He may not be bedridden that entire time. I'm not sure. In, in a strange twist of events, she is arrested and she basically tells the cop who arrests her, I know who I want to cook next. I want to cook next for you. You cause my trouble. (laughs) So very blatant even at that point, which you see a complete turnaround during the trial. She's very blank faced. She's described as icy and cold and emotionless. So she's still at her quippy comments during this stage. I don't know how or why, but she's allowed to visit Joseph in the hospital before being carted off to jail. So strange. Very strange. And Joseph was furious at this. He was shocked that she was allowed in and had a lot of furious questions that were aimed at her uh, because she walked in the door. And during this time, a nurse came in to see if he needed water, I guess. Tilly looks at the nurse and looks back at uh, Joseph and says, you know, if he gives you any trouble, just hit him upside the head with the two by four. <laughs> oh my gosh. And shocks the nurse, of course. And then so after bold. that, very <laughs> bold. And then after that, she kisses him on the cheek and then she leaves. Or she may have kissed him on the lips. I can't remember. Either way, she kisses Joseph and then she leaves for jail. So just a, a bizarre woman at this point and bizarre set of circumstances being allowed to visit the person she was about to kill. Well, and she was ultimately found guilty for the murder, the murders of those first four husbands. Specifically, well, actually, the first three. Well, the thing is, uh, I think it was evidence, but she was specifically convicted for the murder of Frank, which I find funny. They didn't do anything specifically about Joseph. Well, and the, the thing is, is that they had the bodies exhumed mm-hmm. and kind well, of solidified the whole thing. That's an interesting point. An anonymous and the doctors, letter. in the midst of that, their chemists said that there was enough arsenic in the bodies to kill a dozen men. Yeah. So it was actually an anonymous letter that tipped them off. You know, they saw what had happened to Joseph Klemek, but an anonymous letter came into the authorities and said, go dig up the body of Frank and you'll find arsenic in his system. So they do. They dig up his body, they cut him open, they find arsenic in his system still. And I was looking... You're just so nonchalant about that, Michael. They dig him up, they cut him open, and they find arsenic. <laughs> Here's my line of thought, because it... Gotta have a little bit of remorse in your voice there. <laughs> <laughs> it made me wonder, how long does arsenic stay in the body? And I guess if you're dead, it doesn't process through your body very quickly, it stays in there. But it only takes a few days for arsenic to get through. So some of these people, the amount, I think, between the three bodies, they had enough to kill 12 men. So I think the official report was that they had enough to kill four men per body. Mm. Because after the the first body, after Frank, they actually went and dug up the first two husbands and they found about the same amount in each. It makes me wonder, you know, just how much arsenic she fed them in each dish because they didn't die right away. Yeah. So after this happened, a couple of relatives of her came to the authorities and said, please go look at these graves because they were starting to get suspicious as well. And these were the three cousins that she poisoned as well. Right. So those relatives of Tilly were dug up and exhumed and also investigated, and they were also found to have arsenic. It just gets worse from there. That's when they go to dig up Nellie's husband. He's found with arsenic. And that's when they go and uh, dig up the three children that she also killed. Some people believe that Tilly killed these people. A couple others believe that Nellie was the one who killed the children. Uh, Specifically, one of the children got sick and Nellie insisted that she take care of the kid and the kid died you know, in her household. So that's part of the reason that some people believe that Nellie was the true culprit there. Nevertheless, that was enough that you had mentioned actually that the trial only lasted, what, 120 minutes? Was it? Uh, Yeah, I think think they deliberated and, and came to a decision in an hour and 20 minutes. Which is fast. Yeah, super fast for you know, multiple murder case. But then they only convicted her on one. <laughs> yeah. She received life in prison and eventually she died in prison. Of but, a heart attack. Yeah, but Joseph Klemek was insistent that he was going to have her hanged. Yeah. But Joseph it never happened. And uh, the prosecutor that was working, I think his name was McLaughlin. He also, you know, was ambitious. He saw this as somebody, he saw the trend of women being tried for murder and then walking free. 
Mm -hmm. And he was determined to see that she was hanged as well to kind of make a big name for himself. And we were talking about this. He was one of the people who was kind of purporting the name of the Lady Bluebeards or the Bluebeard Click. Right. And this was a theory around the time. And I guess, you know, there was Tilly, there was Nellie, and then there was one other w woman who isn't, you know, there's not much known about her. I think her name was Willie. <laughs> Tilly, <laughs> Nellie, and Willie. Tilly, Nellie, Willie. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> Given all of the other names we've gone through, Joseph, John, Joseph, Joseph, and John. So there was this apparent, they've called it the poison ring. And they believed that there was a group of women in this neighborhood that were all committing uh, these murders for life insurance fraud. And they were called the Lady Bluebeards. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I guess a couple of newspaper headlines named Tilly, the high priestess of the Bluebeard clique, which just sounds very... Which is just so weird. <laughs> yeah. It's not a very occulty case. It's pretty straightforward, but it has well, this... Well, and, and I think if you look up information on Tilly, sometimes you'll find it listed as a cult poison killer. Yeah. And it's not really occultic at all. It's just straightforward. You know, this woman was a serial killer that used rat poison. And I I wasn't... Okay, so maybe I'm in the dark here by myself, but I was not aware of why they were called the Lady Bluebeards. Apparently, Bluebeard is actually a French folk, folk tale about a guy who went on to murder several of his wives in different ways. So they were basically taking this term and flipping it on these women who were going off and doing uh -huh. the same thing with their husbands. Well, and they were trying to pin several murders on each of the women. I think the other two were let go and, and nothing stuck. Yeah. It, and it all kind of pointed back to Tilly. You can go back and see that McLaughlin, after Tilly was not hanged, he kind of just gave up and Nellie walked free. I think she spent a year in prison or a year in jail. I can't remember. But um, he kind of gave up with her. And she just, she was said to be more naive. Many people kind of made it sound like she was under the sway of Tilly. And the people kind of felt sorry for her. The judge in this trial actually had both of the women given IQ tests. And remember, they only speak broken English. They speak their parents' tongue. Right. So this IQ test is given in English, and they're declared to have the IQ, the equivalent, basically, of 11-year-old children. As we know from Genevieve Forbes before, this was not the case. She declared that Tilly was actually very intelligent and darkly so. But as far as the press was concerned, neither of these women were very intelligent. So Nellie walked and was not tried for the murder of her husband or any of the three children. And I find it funny that Tilly later on, she, she actually lived a peaceful life by all accounts in prison, but then she died of heart failure or, or a, a heart attack, which is funny because that was the original death listed of her first husband. Of her first husband, so yeah. So kind of a, a funny, ironic wraparound there. Yeah, so here's a woman who came to the U.S. as a child, married at an early age, 14, and lived for nearly 30 years with his first husband before going on this spree. No real answers or insight as to exactly why it all began, but the fact is it began, and just a string of murders, humans and animals, and it ends with a conviction on one of those, a life sentence. She's not given the death sentence. She is a woman in that time, which stood out in the trials because there were a lot of women who were going to trial for murder and were being let go. And the press was basically saying, it's because they're beautiful. They're pretty. They're attractive. But here's Tilly, and they're saying she's guilty because she's not pretty. She's not attractive. She's homely. And they eventually pin a murder. All these other women, no matter the amount of evidence that was against them, they were walking. So it was kind of a strange time and a strange time for Tilly to stand out among all these other trials and all these other accusations as the one to get stuck with a life sentence. Well, Forbes had actually said, and this, this was actually the harshest sentence that had been given for a woman in Cook County right. to this date. But Genevieve Forbes, she had another pretty famous saying that Tilly went to the penitentiary because she never went to a beauty salon, which I thought was a 
pretty powerful mm. statement coming from a woman yeah. at that time that was in a good position. It's kind of weird. Even the media at that time was frustrated. And they were honestly the ones doing a lot of the work, I believe, because a lot of the women uh, that were let free were posing for newspaper pictures. They were uh, wearing fashionable hats. They become celebrities. Yeah. That scene you see in Chicago kind of stems from that same imagery. Mm -hmm. But even people like Forbes and some of the prosecutors in those trials were getting frustrated and saying things like, you know, these people's good looks are making you forget all of this very clenching evidence. And Tilly was not so fortunate. Yeah. And even to the point that her trial uh, was considered a farce. I mean, it was considered a, a chaotic. It was chaotic. There were people laughing at um, a lot of the witnesses that were brought up. Tilly, we've seen her before being very loud, very uh, bold. In this trial, she's actually icy cold. She laughs at one story that one of the grave diggers that are brought up to, and, and it's funny, he has nothing to do with digging up the husbands. He just happens to see one of her affairs going on. But she laughs at his story because it's apparently told in a funny voice and a lot of the people in the courtroom laugh along with her. It got so bad that the judge actually stood up at one point and said that this is not a theater and had to get people to calm down just to continue with the trial. Perhaps that's part of the reason it only took 120 minutes because nobody seemed to take it very seriously. And perhaps that's really why uh, she only got the one conviction or over Frank. Yeah, and it was, I think, an hour and 20 minutes, not 120 minutes, but... Oh, uh, yeah, they, I guess that makes a big difference, Yeah, it? so <laughs> <laughs> just a strange set of circumstances, a strange life that, I mean, turns into just a string of tragic deaths and poisoned individuals and animals included, children included. She died in prison, I think, 1936 it was. She dies in prison of a heart attack, and that's it. But definitely fits the bill as being a monster that has lived among us. Oh, definitely. Uh, she's even more en enigmatic than uh, Holmes and Bathory because we don't have a motive. <laughs> so yeah. uh, another one for the history books. So there you have it, folks. We hope you enjoyed a little chat about Tilly Klemek, the poison widow. Or the high priestess. Or the high of priestess the of the Bluebeard clique. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They can just make all kinds of stuff up in the press, can't they? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> I wasn't going to say too much there. Yeah, so good hanging out with you all again this week. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, share with you and hope you continue to enjoy it. Please continue your feedback. We enjoy hearing from you. You can contact us through themonsterguys.com or on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at themonsterguys. Until next week, we hope you are preparing for Halloween. It's going to be an exciting few weeks. By the way, if you're listening to this on the date of release, then tomorrow, Small Town Monsters will have their release of Invasion on Chestnut Ridge. If you'd like to read our review, we have a review over at themonsterguys.com on the film. And we also do an interview with Seth Breedlove, the director and producer of Small Town Monsters Invasion on Chestnut Ridge. You can find that part two of our Strange September series. If you want to get insights and some behind the scenes conversation about the filming of that movie. And I got to tell you, folks, this is going to be one to watch. This is definitely broadening their scope, encompassing a lot of different phenomena and, and creatures and experiences. Definitely not one to miss. So tomorrow, that film drops. That's October 20th. And I believe you're going to be able to get that on most streaming services or just go to smalltownmonsters.com and find the info there. Uh, and then, of course, Stranger Things comes out in not too long from now. And then we've got Halloween. So I hope everybody is ready. We've got a great end of the month this October to celebrate. Plenty of things to do and we'd still love to see more of your uh, your costume photos if you want to send them to us. Until then, you guys have a great week. Stay safe and we love hearing from you so uh, drop us a line. We'll see you. Good night. Good night.